Revelation chapter 18 is our text for this evening. If you're visiting with us, we're glad to have you. We're getting toward the end of the book of Revelation. And uh, chapter 18 should be a little easier than chapter 17. Uh, The theme of chapter 18 is God's destruction of Babylon again. It's not a, a new theme, but the picture that we get of Babylon or Rome here is one that has not been emphasized too much. It is Rome's materialism. And some have even gone so far as to describe this as kind of a, a, a picture of the economic collapse of the empire. Uh, while that might be ultimately in mind or partially in mind, uh, I think the materialism that is reflected in the chapter is not just economics. Uh, materialism is another way of saying fleshly living, worldly living. And so Rome has lived by the flesh. She has become an empire that has concentrated on that kind of lifestyle, a life that is concentrated on glory in this world and getting glory from men in a blasphemous kind of way, setting herself up as proud and arrogant, thinking of herself as indestructible. And of course, if you've ever read the Old Testament stories of Tyre and Babylon and those other nations, uh, just as soon as a nation begins to think of themselves as high and exalted, they become ripe for judgment. And so that's what we're going to see here in Revelation chapter 18. Uh, We're not going to go through all of this uh, this evening, but it's there just to kind of make an impression. Uh, You can see that John is relying heavily on Jeremiah chapter 51 which is the great chapter in Jeremiah about the fall of Babylon. And so a lot of the imagery of Babylon's fall, remember Babylon was the greatest nation in the world in Jeremiah's day. Strongest, they had the strongest uh, military, they were rich. Uh, The kingdom of uh, the Neo-Babylonian Empire of Nebuchadnezzar was famously and legendarily wealthy, the hanging gardens and all of those other things associated with it. Well, Rome has become that kind of nation, this wealthy, I don't need anybody, nobody can tell me anything, Uh, we have our own God, we don't need to listen to any other gods, that kind of arrogance, fleshliness, uh, completely ignoring God, no penitence, no sense of remorse, no sense of sin. Uh, That is the picture uh, that comes out of Jeremiah 51 and that John will use to describe Rome. Uh, The chapter divides itself into three parts. Uh, The first eight verses are a prophetic taunt and a summons to fight. Uh, We're probably not used to hearing taunts in the New Testament, but if you read the prophetic literature, uh, there are some of them in there in the Old Testament. Uh, Perhaps one of the most famous taunts delivered by a prophet would be the one by Elijah to the prophets of Baal, how sarcastic he gets, you remember, on that occasion. But uh, Isaiah delivers these, Jeremiah as well, you know, call to your God, see if they can deliver you, uh, that kind of thing. And uh, so we have that kind of thing going on here. Uh, Then in verses 9 through 20, we have three laments of the nations. We're going to hear the nations pouring out their grief at the collapse and the destruction of this great empire that has kept them economically afloat as well. And then the chapter will end in verses 21 through 24 with a symbolic action that announces judgment. Uh, We noted in chapter 17 that there is an abundance of evidence in chapter 17 that the enemy, the harlot, the Babylon, however you want to describe it, is Rome. And there is more evidence to that effect in chapter 18. Uh, And I say that because, uh, as we've noted before, there is a growing sense, I think, among some people within our fellowship that maybe the book of Revelation is about the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, It seems to me, though, that if you read the clues that John gives us in chapter 17 and 18, that we cannot come to that conclusion. Uh, Some other evidence to consider 18... Verses 11 through 19, we have this long list of riches that are flowing into this great city and that are not going to be traded anymore. It is a picture of a great commercial power. Well, it seems to me that you would have a hard time 
arguing that this could describe Jerusalem in the first century. Uh, they had the temple, but that was about it. Uh, the Jews were not known for being a wealthy kingdom. Uh, they were known for being rebellious and other things, but they certainly weren't uh, a great city like Ephesus or Antioch or something like that. And of course, when you think of a great commercial power in the ancient world, the first nation that would have come to your mind in the first century would have been Rome. They controlled everything on the map. Theirs was the economic power. There's really no other way to identify that. Uh, also, the, the picture there is of a sea trading power uh, because we have the merchants of the earth lamenting this, but also the captains of the ships who loaded their ships with these things and traded them all over the world. Well, again, that really doesn't describe Jerusalem. Jerusalem wasn't really close to a harbor. If you wanted to trade in Jerusalem, you had to get in a wagon, go down the mountains and the hills of Judea over to Caesarea, but there is no seaport connecting Jerusalem to the rest of the world. Uh, they were not a sea trading power, but Rome on the banks of the Tiber River certainly was. Uh, the goods in verses 11 through 13 are more appropriate to the opulence of Rome. We have here linen, purple, silk, scarlet, citron, ivory, bronze, iron, marble. Even today, if you go to the city of Rome, there's still plenty of ancient marble standing around it. But uh, not so. In Jerusalem, things are built out of the local materials, limestone, but not so much marble, hardly any marble at all. And then in uh, 1818, uh, we have another one of these descriptions. Uh, what city is like the great city? Uh, what city could possibly compare to this one? And you'll notice that that is being said by the shipmasters and the merchants of the world. Uh, again, it would be hard, I think, to say that that could possibly be a description of Jerusalem. Uh, in verse 20, Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, because God has pronounced judgment for you against her. And somebody might say, aha, what city is more known for killing the prophets than Jerusalem? Well, um, Jerusalem, of course, literally would fit that description. But remember what we saw back in one of the earlier chapters, uh, chapter 12, I think it was, we have to understand that Rome is a city that became an empire. It is a city that rules the world. And so when we have a reference here to a city uh, uh, and saints and apostles uh, and prophets are called to rejoice, uh, it's Rome that's in mind. And certainly the apostles preached in more than Jerusalem, and uh, the saints were spread out all over the Roman Empire. So again, there's nothing there that pins that down to Jerusalem. And perhaps another thing is what's not mentioned. Normally in the Old Testament, when God is angry at Jerusalem, you know it because God will say something that he has, something like that he has a case with the priests, that the priests have not been teaching the law to his people, or that the prophets have not been prophesying in his name. Well, you get none of that here. None of the classic indicators uh, of, of a Jerusalem that has gone wrong are in this text. Uh, it is actually much broader than that, and so the absence of those things would suggest that this is not Jerusalem either. Uh, but be that as it may, uh, let's go over to chapter 18 and verse 1 and look at the opening scene here. I saw another angel coming down from heaven having great authority. The earth was illumined with his glory, and he cried out with a mighty voice saying, Fallen, fallen, is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place of demons and a prison of every unclean spirit and a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. Uh, this kind of thing, as we've noted, is actually fairly common in the Old Testament to talk about the destruction of an enemy, to kind of advertise the destruction of an enemy as a way of proclaiming its uh it's uh, immorality. We get this in Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Perhaps the first one in the Bible is Judges chapter 5. The Song of Deborah contains a taunt against the Canaanites in it. 
And so this is actually a very long-standing kind of prophetic tr tradition to, to, to talk openly about the fall of this great power. Uh, the angel, we are told in verse 18, is an angel that comes down having great authority. And this is a picture that we are used to seeing at this point in the book of Revelation. Uh, in the Old Testament, of course, angels were seen as agents of God's rule over the nations, and that's the picture that we get here. Angels are pouring out the bowls of wrath. Angels are sounding the trumpets and so forth. But, of course, the New Testament picture is always that uh, now they are subordinated to the Son, that they are carrying out the Son's uh, judgment uh, as he reigns over the universe. Um, Ezekiel 43 is probably the background here. He led me to the gate, the gate facing toward the east. Behold, the glory of the God of Israel was coming from the way of the east. And the, his voice was like the sound of many waters. The earth shone with his glory. And so the glory of God was coming uh, for Ezekiel to see, and of course his great message is that Babylon would eventually fall, God's people would be released and, and, and face uh, uh, relief from their suffering one day. And John is picked uh, from that passage to show us that God is now going to do the same thing to this one. Uh, in Isaiah 21, verse 9, here comes a troop of riders, horsemen in pairs, one said, fallen, fallen, is Babylon, the very same message we get here in verse 2. And then in Amos, I hear the word which I take up for you as a dirge, O house of Israel, she has fallen, she will not rise again, the virgin Israel. So this is language that God uses in the Old Testament, whether it be a foreign nation or God's own people, to announce that God is going to bring judgment, and it is used pretty uh, straightforwardly here. Uh, we're told that uh, she has become a dwelling place of everything that is just rotten and defiled from a Jewish point of view, a place of demons, unclean spirits, unclean and hateful birds. Uh, and again, this is not anything that John is making up. We hear this kind of language when Isaiah talks about the fall of Babylon, when he talks about the destruction of the Edomites, and when Zephaniah talks about all of Israel's enemies, they are described with this kind of language as well. And, you know, people familiar with the Old Testament, more familiar with the Old Testament than you and I are, uh, would have picked this up and understood the imagery pretty clearly. But even if you, say, were a converted Gentile, and maybe you didn't know the Old Testament the way the Jews did, uh, this, this language is still pretty transparent. I mean, fallen, fallen, uh, she has become a dwelling place of demons. There's not much wiggle room in that to make that a, a message of joy and hope. You know? So uh, it, it's a pretty straightforward announcement. Uh, her sin, verse 3, is that all the nations have drunk of the wine of the passion of her immorality. Now, we've heard that before. Uh, we've heard that back in a previous chapter, and remember that image gets turned into the image of the wine press. What do you get wine from? You get it from grapes, and grapes have to be pressed in order to make wine, and so there's that destruction that is kind of the opposite side of this uh, immorality. Uh, but her sin is that she has made the nations drunk with her immorality, as it were, and with her sensuality. Uh, notice the combination of politics plus immorality plus materialism. Uh, they are all interwoven here. We have the nations doing this with her. That's the political aspect. There is her immorality, and then there is her wealth and sensuality. And if you were to ask the question, well, which is it that she has done? Which of these is she going to be judged for? Uh, the answer is, well, it's all of them. Because they are all ultimately the same sin. It is the sin of self-indulgence, self-glorification, of greed and worldliness. And that there just happens to be three ways to say it political alliances, immorality, and materialism. They're all related by that same thread. Uh, we hear this about Babylon. Babylon has been a golden cup in the hand of the Lord, intoxicating all the earth. 
Isaiah says in Isaiah 47 that these have become to you with whom you have labored, whom you have trafficked with you from your youth, each has wandered in his own way. There is none to save you. Uh, we hear about the sensuality of Rome here, her self-satisfied, complacent, arrogant uh, demeanor and attitude toward herself. And so this is the, the world in which John writes these things. This is the empire that is the opposition of God's kingdom. And as is typical for this kind of thing, uh, in verses 4 through 8, John says, Now, those of you that are saints, you better make sure that you don't get caught up in this, because she is going to be destroyed. That's all there is to it. God announces, Fallen is Babylon. And we haven't heard the destruction yet, but you can speak of it as if it's already happened. It's that sure. God can announce it before it even comes. And so if you are part of this, if you participate in it, John says, you're going to get caught with it. Uh, Isaiah 52, 11, come out from among them and be separate. Paul quotes that in 2 Corinthians six seventeen. We hear the same kind of thing over in Isaiah and Jeremiah as well. It is actually a very familiar call in biblical history uh, to stay away from that which is unclean and defiling. We even hear Jesus talking about it concerning the destruction of Jerusalem in Mark 13. You better be far from this place, Jesus says, when this happens, because if you're here, you'll get destroyed with it. Same message here. Um, the rest of this language here is actually pretty pretty straightforward. Verse 5, her sins have piled up as high as heaven. Jeremiah 51, her judgment has reached to heaven. Uh, God has remembered her iniquities. There's so many little hints of things throughout the book, and uh, you know you, you can't just look at all of them, but God has remembered. You remember Jeremiah 31, God makes the promise concerning the new covenant with Israel and Judah that their sins I will remember no more, but these get remembered. These are not forgiven, and God is going to punish them. Why are they not forgiven? Well, we've seen already in the book several times that they won't repent. That God has been trying to get their attention. They won't listen, and so God says, that's it. They're, they're, I'm going to destroy them. Uh, pay her back as she has been paid, and then double in verse 6. Uh, we hear this kind of thing in the Bible uh, as well. Uh, Psalm 137, how blessed will be the one who repays you. And even worse than that in Jeremiah 50, summon many against Babylon, all those who bend the bow and camp against her on every side. Let there be no escape. Repay her according to her work, uh, according to all that she has done, so do to her. And not only pay her back, but we hear in verse 6, pay her double. Uh, Isaiah 40, she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Uh, you get that same thing in uh, Exodus as well, uh, that, that there were uh, certain offenses that had to be paid back double. And then uh, verse 7, to the degree that she glorified herself. That's the sin here. And not just glorifying stuff, but the arrogance, the pride, the materialism, the sensuality, the indulgence, the fleshliness. That's all the same picture here. She lives sensuously to that degree give her torment and mourning. Uh, for she says in her heart, I sit as a queen and I am not a widow and will never see mourning. Uh, there uh, from the taunt against Tyre. Uh, thus says the Lord, O Tyre, you had said, I am perfect in beauty. And for that reason, God was going to bring her down. You know, this idea that we're the most powerful nation in the world, there's no way that we can fall. Uh, we are the, the greatest and we're, we're invincible. Uh, the height of arrogance is what you're supposed to hear there. This language, I'm a queen and not a widow, you know, we're never going to have the bad times. Nobody's going to harm us. Our goods and our wealth will never be taken from us because we're the strongest nation in the world. Uh, God says, for that attitude, I'm going to take you down. And for this reason, therefore, 
um, you will go down. Uh, Isaiah 47 is another background for this. You said, I will be a queen forever, and I will not sit as a widow, no, nor no loss of children. You can hear uh, that. And so God says, verse 10, you felt secure in your wickedness. And you said, no one sees me. Your wisdom and your knowledge, they have deluded you. For you have said in your heart, I am and there is no one besides me. I am and there is no one besides me. Does that ring a bell? Who normally says that in the Bible? God, yeah. You shall have no other gods before me. And here is this arrogant nation calling itself by terms that only should apply to God. So God says, evil will come upon you, which you will not know how to charm away. Disaster will fall on you, for which you cannot atone. Destruction that you do not know will come upon you suddenly. That's the very picture that is painted of Rome in these first eight verses. Let's move on. Uh, this idea that they're going to fall in one day is, again, Old Testament language for a catastrophic judgment. It's not literal. We all know that Rome did not fall in one day. Uh, but God, God's point is, you're not going to believe what I'm going to do to them. This empire that says it will last forever, before you know it, it's going to be gone. It's going to be as if tomorrow it's gone. And so it is God's reaction to this arrogant attitude that we will always be around. Uh, the lament uh, is typical in the Old, uh, Old Testament. We hear this uh, whenever we hear about the destruction of a large empire, center, or city. Uh, and not only do we find it in the Old Testament, uh, we find this kind of thing even in pagan literature. Uh, the Greek playwright Aeschylus, in his play The Persians, uh, talks about Asia Minor in this way. O oh, cities of the land of Asia, realm of Persia, bounteous haven of wealth, how at a single stroke has all your plenteous wheel been shattered and the flower of the Persians fallen and perished. And so, again, it is kind of a way of advertising the destruction of a city or an empire or a nation. And you hear this in the Old Testament uh, as well. When Jerusalem falls, pagans rejoice and the saints weep, but when a pagan city falls, the pagans weep and the saints rejoice. And we get that kind of thing in a couple texts, uh, Ezekiel 27, uh, in their wailing they will take up a lamentation for you and lament over you who is like Tyre. And in 32.16, this is a lamentation, they shall chant it. The daughters of the nations shall chant it over Egypt and over all her hordes. They shall chant it, declares the Lord God. And so it's just another way of, of saying, I'm not just talking about a, an economic downturn here, God says. I'm talking about going out of business. And it's going to be shocking from what you once were to what I do to you. And it's going to cause the entire world to wonder at what in the world has gone wrong here. Uh, and so uh, these three laments have in common uh, the fact that they're all done from afar, weeping and wailing, all astonished at how quickly it happens. And especially prominent in this is the, uh, the economic element. Uh, we don't need to read everything in these lists but uh, you'll notice, uh, for example, verses 9 and 10, the kings of the earth weep and lament when they see the smoke of her burning. They stand at a distance because of the fear of her torment and say, woe, woe, the great city has fallen in one hour. Your judgment has come. The next one's a little longer. The merchants of the earth weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. Because this city has fallen, the economy and the markets have fallen apart. And again, this is something that if you lived in the first century, you would not have thought that this was strange. Um, the uh, port city of Athens was the city of Piraeus, and the Greek orator Isocrates referred to Piraeus as the center of Greece. She established the Piraeus as a market in the center of Greece, 
of such superlative excellence that articles which it is difficult for the several states to supply to each other one by one can all easily be procured from Athens. Remember at one time Athens was the big power uh, in the world and Greece owed her wealth to her. But uh, Strabo refers to Alexandria, Egypt in his day as the world's greatest marketplace. And Roman authors refer to the uh, luxury that the Romans dealt in. Uh, this was almost kind of a proverbial luxury in their day. Uh, Dio Chrysostom was a Roman orator. And you really learn a lot about ancient cultures by listening to the speeches that their uh, orators gave. Uh, notice what he says. Uh, Only then, I continued, will your city be great and strong and truly imperial, since at present its greatness arouses distrust is not very secure. For, said I, in proportion as courage, justice, and temperance increase among you, in that degree there will be less silver and gold and furniture of ivory and of amber, less of crystal and citron wood, ebony, and you see the list. Uh, he actually mentions the ones that are highlighted there, several of the very things that are on John's list here in Revelation chapter 18. And so uh, he goes on to say, As your possessions are now, on account of the great amount of wealth, all of which has been collected from all the world into this one place, luxury and covetousness being prevalent, they are no less likely to kindle the wanton spirit and licentiousness of human beings. Here's one of their own Roman orators saying, we've got too much wealth in this empire and not enough justice and temperance. And even the pagans could see the immorality of the Roman Empire when they looked around at it. Uh, Elias Aristides was a Greek orator who lived at the same time. He says this, Here to Rome is brought from every land and sea all the crops of the seasons and the produce of each land, river, lake, as well as the arts of the Greeks and barbarians, so that if someone should wish to view all these things, he would either have to see them by traveling over the whole world or come to this city. You can see everything that the world has to offer in this one city because we brought it all here. So many merchant ships arrive here, hour and uh, uh, conveying every kind of goods from every people every hour and every day so that this city is like a factory common to the whole earth. Uh, he says that you can see everything uh, all the way from Arabia. There can be seen clothing from Babylon. Um and ornaments from the barbarian world beyond, uh, which arrive in much larger quantity and more easily than if merchantmen bringing goods from Naxos or Synthus had put only put into Athens. Uh, later on, whatever one does not see here, it doesn't exist. If we ain't got it, it doesn't exist. So that it is not easy to decide which has the greater superiority, the city in regard to the present-day cities, or the empire in regard to the empires which have gone before. You know, I can't tell. Is, is it our empire that's the greatest, or is it our city that's the greatest? Uh, this is a, a man from the first century just looking at Rome and saying, wow, this is wealthy, and there is every kind of good flowing into this place. That is exactly what John says here in Revelation 18, verses 11 and following. And, and that whole list of all of these things um, they are trading in all of these things uh, greedily in a sensuous, materialistic uh, arrogance. Um, verse 9, the kings of the earth are going to wail about all of this because to them Rome was a protector. Uh, of course, economically, as long as Rome was in business, they were in business as well. But uh, the treaties that they had with the Romans also meant their protection. And so when Rome goes down, the kings of the earth are going to be more vulnerable. God said against Tyre, Shall not the coastland shake at the sound of your fall when the wounded groan, when the slaughter occurs in your midst? Then all the princes of the sea will go down from their thrones, remove their robes, strip off their embroidered garments. They will clothe themselves with trembling. They'll sit on the ground and tremble every moment and be appalled at you. How you have perished, O inhabited one, from the seas. 
The coastlands will tremble. Yes, the coastlands will be terrified at your passing because the source of their wealth and their strength is gone. Same picture that you get here. Uh, the lament of the merchants. Of course, Rome was their main market and source of wealth, and this lament is therefore prefaced by this long list of luxury goods that we noted is also in the pagan authors, and uh, we have this same kind of judgment against Tyre. Now remember Tyre. Where does Tyre sit geographically? Anybody remember? On the Mediterranean coast. The Phoenicians were famous in the ancient world. They, had, they were a seagoing people. They had ships going all over the Mediterranean world, and they were rich in Old Testament times. Well, the Romans have been doing business all over the world through ships as well. And so just like Tyre, uh, they are going to be judged. As a matter of fact, we even hear the language of a harlot there in Ezekiel, which is the language John used back in Revelation 17. Uh, there's a long list here, 28 items uh, for rhetorical effect, as if, you know, you just keep going on and on and on and on with this list like it never ends. Um, the Roman naturalist Pliny, he was kind of the Charles Darwin of his day, went around looking at uh, all kinds of things. He said this, that the most costly product of the sea is the pearl of the earth's surface rock crystal, and he goes on and he talks about the most precious items that the ancients knew about, and every one that is highlighted there is on John's list as well. And the point is that the ancients were aware of what was wealthy and costly and arrogant and, and uh, sensuous, and they knew that that's the lives they lived, and John is simply pointing out the obvious to them in a sense. Uh, then to the ship owners uh, in... Uh, verses 17 and following. Of course, Rome was what kept their ships busy and making money. Uh, ships in the ancient world were like tractor trailers in our society. You want to keep them full and moving all the time. When they're parked in the dock, they're not making anybody money. And so they were the, the vehicle of commerce in the ancient world. And so when Rome goes down, the shipmasters, the passengers, the sailors, everybody that makes their living by the sea, they're going to be hurt by this as well. And again, we have here an echo of the taunt against Tyre. Um, also, we hear the same kind of language against Babylon, even though she was not a sea-trading uh, power. Uh, her commerce uh, was vast as well. And in Ezekiel 27... They will say, who is like Tyre, like her who is silent in the midst of the sea? Uh, we get that same kind of thing here. What city is like the great city? And the point is, how in the world could this have happened? This empire that seemed invincible, so strong, how can it be destroyed? And these laments are songs of amazement that God could destroy them. They do the typical lamenting, throw dust on their heads, crying out, weeping, mourning, but it's all because God has laid this great power low. And so in verse 20, rejoice over her, heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, because God has destroyed your enemy. And again, we hear these calls in the Old Testament, shout for joy, O heavens, the Lord has done it. The Lord has redeemed Jacob, and in Israel he shows forth his glory. Ezekiel 35, you rejoiced over the inheritance of the house of Israel because it was desolate, so I will do to you. And in Jeremiah 51, 38, heaven and earth and all that is in them will shout for joy over Babylon, for the destroyers will come to her from the north, declares the Lord. And so just the way... These kingdoms persecuted the people of God. God says it's time for you to take your own medicine. To the degree, remember back there in verse uh, 7, to the degree that you were great, to that degree I'm going to take you down. And it's going to be my people's turn to rejoice for a while. And of course, they're going to get the final one. The chapter ends with this uh, scene of judgment, and again, We've seen several of these, but this is another one. And this one is, again, kind of fitting to the maritime imagery. 
A strong angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence and will not be found any longer. Uh, the fall of a millstone is a biblical image for death and destruction. Remember the woman that throws the millstone on Abimelech's head in Judges 9, one of my favorite Bible stories. Uh, Matthew 18.6 Whoever causes one of these little ones to stumble will be better for a millstone to be tied around his neck. And in Jeremiah 51, as soon as you finish reading the scroll, tie a stone it and throw it into the middle of the Euphrates and say Babylon is going to sink just like this scroll. That idea of sinking down into the depths. Remember in ancient imagery, tall things, high things are images of arrogance and pride. Stars, trees, mountains, things like that. And the opposite of pride is God humbling somebody, and so the opposite of high is low, and the lowest thing that the ancients knew is the bottom of the sea. And so you tie a millstone around something or you throw a millstone into the sea, it goes all the way to the bottom. And that's the picture here, that Babylon is not going to be down, brought down just a notch or two. God's going to take it all the way down, uh, cut it down completely. Um, and God says, you're not going to be rejoicing over your wealth any longer. Verse 22, the sound of harpists, musicians, flute players, trumpeters, no more of that. No craftsman of any craft will be found in you any longer. They make idols typically. The sound of a mill, there's not going to be any grain to grind, so no sound of grinding grain. The light of a lamp will not shine because there's not going to be any oil. The voice of the bridegroom and bride, no parties, no good times, all of those are going to be gone because you ruined everything. You, you seduced the world and God's going to judge you. These are typical signs of wealth and luxury. Uh, we hear them again in Old Testament texts like Isaiah and Ezekiel. Um, and so God is going to destroy them completely. Uh, this idea of taking away the voice of the bride and the bridegroom, sound of the millstones, light of the lamp. Again, Jeremiah is the source for that. Because, last word in the chapter is, in her was found the blood of the prophets and the saints and all who've been slain on the earth. It's a murderous, greedy, wicked empire that is ripe for judgment and God says, it's going down. All right, then, uh, we will pick up chapter 19 next time. 19 is happy for a change, so we can look forward to that.